it can work against us. If you don't believe in 90 and 92 cent all-time priced cows and don't come with the volume between now and the 1st of February, then those packers are going to take a deep seat on me and a faraway look and they're going to drop those prices on me because the volume that they were willing to pay for did not materialize and they will not consider you as a significant factor to their daily requirements. Now if you do, on the other hand, believe in what we're doing, if you believe in production and putting that volume up to reach an even higher figure, and that is possible, the, the extra is there, but I've got to have more volume to reach it, you'll have that as the other hand of the coin. You have the same potential, but it goes either way. It can work for you or against you. I've discouraged public publications of our prices. I've discouraged some people from Minnesota and North Dakota and Wisconsin from putting in their papers the fact that we had priced our cows and got the price I don't know how many of you realize it, but just for a second on those cows, 20% of that string of cows were breakers, in other words, fat cows. When we sold that set of cows at 90 cents a pound, breakers on the open market, so to speak, were 70 50. Now, I don't know if 1950, 100 weight is anything to you or not, but if you got a thousand pound cow, to me, that's 195 bucks. I don't know how you can live without it. Now, a boner cow, at the time that string of cows bring 90 cents a pound, was worth 77.50. Now, you take that same thousand pound carcass and you're looking at a twelve dollar and fifty cent spread between what she brought and what she was quoted on the provisioner now that string of cows ran about thirty percent forty percent rather boners so you see there was about forty percent roughly of that block that got that 1250 advantage. At the same time, that thin cow, and the canter cutter cow, <clears throat> was worth about 85 or 86 cents and brought 90. So you say he may have got penalized. Not really. He had a kind that helped generate the extreme price for the least value of that block of cows, granted. But he also couldn't have sold his individual canter cutter cows at that 90 cents a pound because he didn't have but about 25 or 30 percent roughly of that block and so the volume wouldn't have dictated it he'd gotten a price anyway. So he did end up with a four or five dollar a hundred premium and that's got to be worth something to him anyway. Well we've got those things <clears throat> that I call them bragging points, but you've got to be discreet in the way you handle yourself when you're discussing it, because like I said, industry will work for you, and we're having that reception today. Industry can work against you, and you've had that for 15 or 20 years. Now you've got the respect and the total confidence of industry. You don't have that as members of this organization as a crutch anymore. You can't believe the snide remarks and the rebuttals I received when I first come into this organization by a few of the membership in this organization. What are you doing in here? 
you packers have skinned us for so many years, and what are you going to do in here now as a professional? Take us down a little further, and on and on. Well, I'll tell you, and I told you at the time I came, the animosities toward industry has never, never been from industry to y'all. The rebuttals and the animosities have been created by you toward them. They have always recommended, uh, recognized the tremendous power and the tremendous potential you had for them as a group. All they have ever done is waited to pay you for that when you had the sense to put it together. You've seen the obvious reaction in those May fed steers. You've seen the obvious reaction in those December cows. You have to believe me because it is the fact that industry wants this organization. I want to repeat, a corporate head buyer of the largest producer of hamburger meats east of the Missouri River. He called Steve Bohr, a young man that works with me in Corning. And when we shipped in May or June that block of 2,500 or 3,000 cows out of the north end of this country, he bought them and was reluctant to take them because he didn't think we could deliver. In the next month, we shipped another 12 or 1,500 cows, and he plus almost any other major packer up there was after them because they recognized that we finally had the method of delivery that, we, that they needed so desperately. And in November, he called and talked to Steve and simply said, it is almost phenomenal what I see happening in the National Farmers Organization. I cannot believe that you have the power almost overnight to put this product together and deliver it as you've said, but more importantly, I can't believe that in a very, very short few months you've been able to take your own people without going out and hiring cattle buyers or so forth in this state of Wisconsin and describing those extremely large blocks of cattle to me better than my own salaried cattle buyers are doing. He said it's like night and day. I don't know what kind of a compliment from industry you people are looking for, but I can tell you as a head corporate cattle buyer for an outfit that killed around 40, 45,000 head of cattle a week, I never complimented this organization that way because I never saw that kind of response. <clears throat> but you got it today. I'm not thick-headed enough not to have complimented it if I'd have had the accurate descriptions, the astute deliveries, and then really got what I bought, but I never could. But you're doing it today. That's the new side of your National Farmers Organization. Now, Devon Woodland and Orrin Lee Staley continually press us to be accurate. They continually press us to be honest. They continually impress upon us the necessity to make each deal clean to avoid animosities between the home office and the membership. It's got to be a coordinated communion type thing. Well, I believe that too. Because as Dave Miller said, we've had wrecks. Well, I don't know how many of you have handled cattle, but it isn't like inventory and nuts and bolts. You got a live, unpredictable commodity on your hand that's a perishable, 
and you will have upsets. The day that there will be no ab upsets in the cattle business is the day that computers and machines will control them from birth to the dinner plate. And as long as a human element is involved, whether it's a so-called professional or whether it's a so-called farmer feeder, you're going to have mistakes. I'll never eliminate them. If I don't make a mistake, I'm not doing anything the way I feel about it. And I don't think you're doing anything if you don't have mistakes. But the problem we have then is the communication factor to find out and to hopefully avoid additional mistakes between the shipper and myself. So all I ask you to do is communicate with me. I won't spend the time of day trying to explain to you that a cancer-eyed cow with cancerous tendons going down to her heart from her neck shouldn't have been condemned. I wouldn't have eaten the damn thing myself, and I don't think you would have or you wouldn't have shipped her. Well, don't complain that they tanked her. And I feel sorry for the dog that she has to go to to feed. But I will help you on legitimate problems. I've got men in Kansas that shipped cattle to us and graded half choice. Those cattle needed more time. That man sincerely did not know it, and I accept that as my responsibility, and he got barbecued. That's where I come in. That's where our people come in. We've got to extend to you that professional courtesy of being able to properly advise you and hopefully not disappoint you that no, you can't ship those cattle. They are not completed yet and they won't do you any good. There you avoid problems because you as a cattle feeder, as every cattle feeder is, you overestimate your own production you put on rose-colored glasses and you think the cattle are fatter than they are before they are and you ship them and if your opinion wasn't right, you're not wrong. It was that crooked packer and that dummy in Corning. And that's the way the game's played. So I've got to be able to furnish you with that objective, unbiased opinion of your employee that's at your hand tip to bring out and look at your cattle. I don't have anything really to add to our cattle program here today. I've got a lot of things that I'm gratified about. I'm particularly gratified of the response and the, and the cooperation that you as a national membership have given me in the home office. But I want you to know one thing. A year ago, it was an I-type situation in Corning. I was going to do this. I was going to do that. But if you attended the meeting yesterday or if you happened to hear anything about it, you also heard that it's strictly a we situation today. There are no more islands in this department in Corning, Iowa. I have totally competent people to help you. These men are part of a team of which I happen to be a member. I have no more individualists there. I'm not one myself. We want you to feel free to use us. And if you'll only remember the May fed cattle and the December cull cows, you'll know what the we aspect of this organization can do for you as an individual. Ornley, I appreciate the opportunity. Thank you very much. Thank you, Walt. You want to make the announcement on the record? The director of the division. Thank you, Ornley. Rather than uh, give you a bunch of statistics and 
facts and figures, I decided to give you a little philosophy this afternoon on something that I think relates to what we've been talking about all during this convention. We're all aware of the law of gravity and how compelling it is. We know that anything we throw up must come down. And yet after great expenditures of time, manpower, yes, even life, we have learned to cope with gravity and actually be released from it at times with our space program. It's one of the greatest laws that affects us every day. Well, in the same relationship, we have the law of supply and demand. And there has been much labor, time, money and lives involved trying to find a power to overcome or to countervail with the law of supply and demand. And we have that. It's called farm power. How do we know it works? Well, we've got two classic examples to draw from that are very recent. We have always thought that farm power was just in the holding of a product, and that's where the power was derived from. In our very beginning, we thought that, and yet today, uh, we know that it must be something more than that. And the two examples I want to relate to you are as follows. If you had somewhere between 75 and 80 percent of a commodity totally in the United States, uh, do you think you could price it? If you had it all blocked and everyone doing the same thing? You really think you could price it by just blocking it? You say, sure. Well, then, how about wheat and corn? You have non-members and members alike that have it blocked and aren't moving it, but I don't see the price going up. On the other hand, we have some commodities that have some very adverse conditions against them as far as price, and yet they're better today than they were yesterday. And I speak specifically of sunflowers. If you were to double the production of wheat in the United States from last year to this year, would your price at harvest time this year be higher or less than what it was the year before? I think we know the answer to it. It'd be less. Yet in sunflowers, we did just that. We almost doubled the production. And the price for flowers this year was, in fact, higher and still is at harvest time and right after harvest than it was when the flowers themselves were be being planted. Well, what is the difference? The difference is that we have a block that we're moving. In grain, we, all of us, collectively, are holding it to try to affect the price that way. There's your two examples to think about for just a moment. And so then I say, if that's the case, farm power should be defined as follows. You only have farm power when it's moved together as one unit. But the movement is the key word. Now we know that you're starting to understand that because we've made a milestone in the organization, one very recently. Now that milestone is that for the first time, we're delivering sunflowers under contract at less than what the market is the day we're delivering them. And yet the members are delivering because they understand the importance of contract, their word, and movement. Because if you don't stand behind your contract, you can never have movement. So you are catching on to what is the basis of farm power, and that is the movement itself. Well, I give this example to you because the awesome law of gravity, how many people would really think we could overcome it? Yet when you think about it, you know we have. If we can overcome that law, we can surely overcome the law of supply and demand. Thank you. Next, we will have a report from the Hog Division, Alan Scraw, Director. You today for a few minutes about the 
direction that the hog department is going to be taking in 1979. We want to tie some of the price conditions that we're looking at come fall because there are going to be some changes in the trends and the numbers but I do want to tell you about the program and the direction that we're going to go but I think we're going to have to get these lights can you see the transparency the transparency you're looking at there the nation's most complete marketing and bargaining program that's the billing that we have used for the hog department's program for the past year. Okay. Uh, we've been billed this past year as the nation's most complete marketing and bargaining program. Now, on the basis of that, there has to be an explanation why we would say the nation's most complete. As far as the phase of marketing, there isn't anything that the hog department cannot do that anyone in the industry would do. Plus, we have the concept of collective bargaining and a cost of production or a floor price. I'm going to come back to that in a second. In addition, we have gone to a public advertising program in the Pig American magazine and the National Hog Farmer uh, billing our program as the most complete. We have put together a structure whereby we have uh, 55 second uh, radio tapes available for use in the collection point areas advertising the program. Hopefully in 1979 we're going to be in position to uh, make this program available to all the major hog producing counties across the United States. Can somebody... oh, we got to put another one. Okay, we're getting organized. <laughs> okay, the transparency you're looking at here, if you remember, uh, back... Can we get this thing off of here? Testing. We're still in business now. Now we're, now we're cooking with gas. Okay, looking at this transparency here, we have started out in 1976 with a commitment to bargain, an inventory of 7,000 people that believed it could happen. Hog producers from all over the United States. Some of the biggest hog producers that put their list on, their name on this list to bargain collectively were producers that produced upwards of 100,000 head. They believe in the concept in the program. Then we had to go ahead and develop a program that would work for any size hog producer, which we did. We negotiated supply contracts back in, in 1977. We improved these contracts in 1978. And in 1978, we introduced the hog contract for NFO members which put us in a position to be able to move the hogs in the direction and in the program that would get the most dollars for our members. Yes, you're going to find there's days we're going to be under the market, there's days we're going to be over, but the direction that those hogs move will have the greatest effect on bargaining and should return the most dollars to the producers. Then, in 1979, next year, Next year, we're planning on going into a negotiations as far as a floor price contract or a cost of production clause. The interesting thing of all this is, and this is maybe a little, a little uh, 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 cliche here, but the hog industry suppliers do not turn on the radio to find out the price of hog feeders. I was over to talk to some of the forward people from Monsanto. They're going to have a convention here next week, and there will be a lot of producers into that convention. But could you imagine Monsanto saying, uh, out here, you as a producer, turn on the radio 
and we've got uh, antibiotics coming on our medicated feed or the price of hog feeders is down five dollars today it looks like a steady trend can you imagine doing that type of business no that is not the way you do a, a legitimate business so on that basis we have to change our program we have incorporated in the program about three phases number one here or number two on this transparency, the greater assist the producer in determining which way his hog should be marketed to return the most dollars to him. The professional people that we have hired to work with you as producers will come to your farm. You can call the collection point for an appointment. They will sit down and talk with you. They will explain the grade and yield sheets. They will explain the merit program, but that program will be designed for your particular operation. Some of you move in semi-load lots direct from the farm into a particular packing plant. Others of you top your hogs out every week. Some of you may put 150, 200 head in a lot and take them out all in one shot. But at any rate, those people are designed and trained to work with you in designing and training the, uh, or designing a program for your operation. The third point on here, you have grade and weight sales. The grader assists the producer in determining what type of hogs will give the best results on a grade and yield program. Different plants have different merchandising techniques and as a result they demand different types of, of raw product and on that basis to get the top dollars in the program to make the program work for a company and in order to have a contract you've got to have a program that's going to be beneficial to both groups it cannot be one way so on that basis we want to put the right hogs in the right plant and those hogs have got to match the merchandising program that that plant would have here you are looking at another phase of the program and I might mention we just uh, sold a couple loads this morning that fit into this. That's forward contracting. Your market formulation is based off of the Chicago Mercantile uh, Exchange quotations, and it's a sale price at a guaranteed cash delivery price sometime down the road. You do not have to put up margins or have margin calls. And on this basis, a young man getting, far, getting started in the hog business can turn around, build himself a cash flow, then he can lock in his hogs, he can take his documents, go to his banker and say, if my management ability gets these hogs together, then this, this, and this will happen. And he's in a position to deal with it. And on that basis, it's been a real asset to a lot of the new people uh, that have come into the program. The bottom line of that transparency is that the staff that we have assembled has one goal in mind and that is to design the program work with you and the marketing of your hogs now i want to tell you about some of that staff because there was some concern express, expressed here in the convention earlier to that the fact that we had so many industry people involved in this in the staff per se I want to tell you about a number of those staff people and I'm going to take them at random with no particular sequence. Heading up the negotiations in Corning, Iowa is Roger Blank who had been with Wilson and Company for about 28 years. He was in charge of their total procurement and their total sales program of fresh pork. He left that position to take on the job as plant manager at Mammoth, Illinois. His assistant in uh, the office in your home office is Harley McLeod who is with Morell and Company about 24 26 years about the same now there's over 50 years of experience in marketing marketing and merchandising hogs we go out to the country we've got uh, people and rather than get into a long description of them I want to tell you about them over in Ohio Indiana we've got Wayne Leedy who used to fill the uh, feed the kill at the Marhofer plant. We've got Dave Chase, who is the assistant manager of the Reynolds Steel Farm down at Henderson. Uh, we've got uh, Jim Waddell, who came to us from Oscar Meyer in Illinois. 
uh, Wisconsin and Minnesota. We've got Mason Mace, who was a former armor man and then did some work in the sales program. Jack Moore was a regional sales manager for petroleum products, uh, selling basically to farmers. Ken Schwering, the assistant head buyer from Farmland Industries. Bill Talbert, who was a successful feeder uh, pig operation. He run about five to 7,000 head. His son has taken over the farm now. Cecil Connery, who has a farrow to finish operation. His son has taken over the farm there. Merle Sunken, who raised 12 to 1,400 head of hogs uh, 10 years ago and has worked with the organization since. And we can go on and on. Bob Ledford, some of you may know him, who had some problems in, in Illinois. Those problems, by the way, for the people from that area have been resolved, and hopefully that thing will completely resolve itself. There's a lot of things in, involved in that one. Those of you from that area know what I'm talking about. Clarion Hansen, off the Sioux City Yards. Gene Henning, off of the Omaha Yards. Harold Hammer, who passed away, came from Hammer Order Buyers. These staff people, are with you for one purpose, and that is to get you as many dollars as they possibly can for the hogs on your farm. Now, no plant manager in his right mind would hire somebody to pay more for the hogs than he had to. These people were hired by those plants and were successful because they were good at their job. Now, they're using their expertise, knowledge, to work for you in establishing a price on hogs. Go on. Okay, in addition to having those options uh, available, we've got a number of benefits that include a, uh, a uh, reserve for Packer bankruptcy to protect your money. We have a in-transit death loss protection clause we have the plan for cost of production that you looked at a little bit earlier and numerous other benefits. If you're interested in these, I want you to, before you leave here, to go by the hog booth because there are several staff people there that will sit down, we'll talk about your marketing situation and see if we can work out a program that would be beneficial uh, to you and your family after you get back home. In order to make this program work better, as well as the other commodity programs, the National Board some time ago have instituted a commodity membership. Now those of you that are, are not uh, participating members at this time have not joined the organization, I would ask you to join it. Try our hog program for a year. And all you have to do is, is come into the program and uh, Immediately after your uh, contract is fulfilled, you're cut loose. You're in it for one year. Try it, because I think we have got the world's best hog program. And on that basis, there's a couple things I want to tell you about that, but I want to go on here to the next, to the next transparency. This transparency that you see here is a, an approximation of the number of collection points we have across the United States. Now we're building these collection points into a structure that we hope should, by the time we come back here a year from now, put us in position to have those 30%. I'm going to explain a piece of that structure to you uh, after a while, but I do want to tell you several things that have happened in the industry in the last uh, six months that I think are, is of real importance. We have written a contract with John Morrell and Company, which incorporates the reduced checkoff that many of you uh, have heard. We're going to a, a one, uh, one standard service charge. And here's the reason. There isn't any one of us that should have to pay money to insure a packer's check. Let him pay for his own insurance. If he can't put up a bond, if he can't put up the nickel a hundred to cover his own check, then we don't want to do business with him anyway. And many packers will buy that concept. Another one, the department is providing a service to the packing industry by putting together lots of hogs. Well, on that basis, why shouldn't the packer pay that as a part of his procurement cost? 
and the Packers will accept that. The next thing that we're talking about here is the in, de in, de uh, in transit death loss. Now this one belongs to us. We're protecting our own livestock from our lot to the collection point or to the plant as the case may be. Going into a little further, we have NFO Inc., which is collective bargaining. That is your checkoff to support the organization. That one you have worked with, the collection point. But on this basis, we want to put some of these costs on the shoulders of the people that have to be responsible for them and get the benefits from them. And most of the packing industry has accepted this concept. I want to tell you about a meeting I had several weeks ago, and it's of very significant importance because there were several statements made that I think we have to take into some real serious consideration as we leave here and go into our programs. Because this meeting was, took place in Chicago, there was about 60 Packer representatives, mostly presidents and vice presidents. There was a few buyers, but very few buyers in the meeting. It was sponsored by the American Meat Institute, and there was a panel. The panel discussed what's wrong with the hog industry, because you know most of the packing companies lost money this past year, or at least they tell us they did. So after much deliberation, they talked about what the cost of production would be, and some of the people came with a figure as low as $36. One man who we had talked with, who spoke to our convention last year, said that his sources showed 43 to 44 dollars and he said if we put a 10 percent profit on that that's going to put us into 47 uh, 48 dollar category and he said I think we have to expect to pay that kind of money for hogs next year but lo and behold on this panel they had an economist the economist got up and told him and I don't mean to be derogatory towards the economist I should say an advisor he happened to have a degree in economics and he said in, for, in order for the packing industry to get healthy, he says you're going to have to lower the law, raw product cost. Immediately I asked the question, I says why lower the uh, raw product cost? Why not increase your merchandising and sales ability? And this man came back and said, well, I don't know that we can get these people to do it. He said, and besides, they're awful tough to deal with, and they won't buy our product. And he went on for 15 minutes, and he says, well, in reality, I guess the farmer is the line of least resistance, and that's where we have to go. The significant thing of that whole conversation is the thinking behind the advisors that are talking to the industry people. I talked to almost every packer in that uh, meeting that day and after we talked for a considerable length of time with those people they need two things they need more hogs and they want them cheaper now I told them we'll give them more hogs but we want them to we want to floor them out at that forty seven forty eight dollar uh, price whatever the average cost of production would be and folks the packing industry did not back away from you if you want a floor price contract in hogs next year, then every producer, and every producer with an interest in hog production, should get those five names on that sheet of paper that we have talked about, and talk to those people. And as we circulate our staff, and I'm going to show you the structure that we want to develop over the next uh, 12 months, as we circulate our staff through the United States, they will have the opportunity to take yourself and meet with those five people to bring them into the program. But you've got to warm them up. You've got to ask them to participate. We had several people walk into, in, into our booth and ask to join the organization and move hogs because they know that the program is working. Large producers. Several guys forward contracted hogs just this morning because it will work, but we need the help of somebody to go out there and make the contact to be the face. If you're talking to a producer and he's interested in forward contracting or in direct shipment loads, get on a telephone and call the office. Talk to myself or Roger or Harley, 
Betty, Dick, Merle, talk to one of us. One of us is usually in there. Sometimes we might not think so, but we're usually there because I've served, noticed on the staff that they're going to be out in the country 90% uh, of the time this next year because, folks, we've got to go after the numbers. We've got to get them. I want to show you just a brief, uh, brief uh, look at this structure because this is what we're basically dealing with now. We're going to tie it into the field staff structure, the two-county structure. And if you look where that circle is in this 16-county quadrant, right there, that is the collection point manager, and that man will be responsible to supervise the program for four people or four collection points in that area. He will be working with the collection points and he will be responsible to sit down with the producers, train the committees how to write forward contracts, how to schedule direct lot shipments, how to top their hogs out every week, how to put them together in packages suitable for various packers. He will have a meeting along with the other collection point people every month, a training meeting in how we should be working with the program to make it work to our best benefit in that particular area. The two county man, when he comes on your farm, or you go as a, as a two county man and make contact with a producer, you will have a man to key off of who should be within 50 miles of where you are. So if you need help to explain the technical aspects of the program, that man will be there. We're not going to go at this thing shotgun effect. We're going to set these units up one at a time, make them function. They're going to parallel the hog production of the United States. We're not going to just go shotgun out here. We're going to set them up in very careful sequence. But on that basis, we should be able to put the, the structure together. Now, our goal, and I met all morning with the, with the staff people, but there you see a field supervisor. Our goal for those field supervisors, and they have committed themselves to this, is to move out of their unit as many hogs as the entire organization is moving today. If those field supervisors have the capability to do that, when we come back here a year from now, you will have 29% of all the hogs in the United States in your program. <laughs> Folks, I think we have the management structure. A year ago, we weren't quite ready for this type of thing here. But I think we have the management structure now, and I think we have the capabilities in the people that we have hired. And I think that we're looking at a turning point here as far as the total hog numbers are because I think with your help we can write floor price contracts, we can put that 28 or 29 percent of the hogs together, and I think that other 1 percent will come automatically. But folks, I think it's very possible. Talk to those neighbors of yours. I don't care if they're large or small, if they're a large producer, very busy, call them up, ask them if you could come over and talk to them, explain the basics of the program and they're in the brochures laying in front of the hog booth, go to the telephone and call either the field supervisor in that area, call that department, we're open till 9 o'clock every night except Friday with you on the phone and your producer after your first 10 calls you'll be able to explain the program just as good as I can and folks in that manner I believe that 1979 is going to be the year that we price hogs thank you All right, would you turn the lights back on or do you want to make